crypto projects that actually don't deliver a product in 2022 are just going to be um, lost. I think this idea that people are going to bet on things that don't exist in the real world or don't actually have applications is going to end. It's time for crypto to put up or shut up. And I think the crypto projects that do that, which a number of them are starting to, are going to soar. But it's going to be a big shake out there. What do you got for biggest business loser in 2022, Freeberg? I agree with you, actually. That was mine. What? I, yeah. Oh, wow. I said crypto bubble will burst. There's a lot of scammy nonsense going on. 90% of these projects okay. you know, are not going to yield value and fundamentals. And I also think that rising interest rates are going to affect uh, the crypto market. There's a lot of leveraged trades into the crypto uh, assets. Uh, those will start to delever uh, as these uh, interest rates shift up. And as a whole, you'll see a large percentage of them go away or decline in value, but a small number will continue to grow in value. Just like we saw when the dot-com bubble blew up, there was a number of companies that survived. Most of them did not. And the few that did survive ended up becoming worth 10 times what the current market value is. And I think that that's still possible with these crypto projects. But uh, I'd say 90% of them are probably going to start to blow up next year. What do you got, Chamath? Well, I guess I'm fading you guys, and I'm also fading implicitly Friedberg's pick of Stripe. But my biggest business loser for 2022 is Visa and MasterCard and traditional payment rails and the entire ecosystem around it. So I think that this is the year you can put on what probably will be the most profitable spread trade of my lifetime, which is to be short these companies and that anybody that basically lives off of this 2 or 3% tax and be long, well thought out Web3 crypto projects that are rebuilding payments infrastructure in a completely decentralized way. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that what you say won't also happen, both that Stripe will have an incredible IPO and that a lot of these scammy crypto projects will go to zero. However, if you read the white papers of these crypto projects and you systematically put together a framework, I think you can be long those and you can be short Visa MasterCard because I think this is their peak market cap. And for those of you who don't know, fading and sports betting, taking the opposite side of a bet, taking the opposite team, I guess. Man, Visa's market cap is half a trillion dollars, huh? It's incredible. It's a, it's a completely contrived duopoly that and doesn't need to exist. And what does Visa mean to a young person? And Ma MasterCard's almost $400 billion, So they're a trillion dollar combined market By cap. By the way, you have, to, you have to understand that the canary in the coal mine here is pretty significant. The most important thing is Amazon, earlier this year, Nick, maybe you can post this, decided to just shut Visa off in the UK. Oh, yeah. Now, Bing. Amazon is not going to do something like that, in my opinion, unless it's a test of what they can do all around the world. And again, going back to this idea of arming the rebels, there really is no need today for all of these small businesses to sit on top of Visa, MasterCard, and Amex Rails. It's unnecessary. And so it'll probably get developed in the developing world first. This is why I think, you know, focusing in markets like Nigeria, to me, are way more exciting than talking about right. these, you know, these fading Western European countries. Who cares? Right. This is where this stuff will happen. Um, it's not to say that those are, those other companies can't tr you know trundle along for a while, but when I say you know we'll look back in ten years and their market caps will be materially lower, anybody in those traditional infrastructure and rails versus anybody in this new infrastructure and rails will be it will look like a no brainer. 10 Do you years consider the buy now pay later companies like a firm and upstart or whatever? I don't know if upstart fits in that category, but some of these buy now pay later businesses as being the alternative to the traditional payment networks or do you think no. that it's a different business? No, I right now I think what what buy now pay later is 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 a rate arbitrage. Right. When as you said earlier rates are very very low so the cost of capital is low. But it again starts to habituate the consumer experience to, I don't need to pay these usurious rates to these three credit card companies to facilitate a transaction of money that I already have or money that I'm good for. That's the big idea, right? And so when you translate that into Web3 in a good project or a good series of projects, you're not going to need these companies. And so it's going to, I think, eviscerate trillions of dollars of market well, not cap to of mention, traditional companies. You also companies. have in between these two, Venmo and Cash right. App, which are not crypto, but they certainly as brands mean more to young well, this people is why like, do you think, than do you Visa think, and MasterCard. Yeah. Do you think Block, what used to be called Square, is a good pair trade against Visa and MasterCard in this context? Yeah, I like it. You know, I think that that, that starts to get closer to, to the truth. My, my perspective is you can kind of short anybody who's public 
because anybody who's public can really only be public or will go public because they feast off of this artificial 2 or 3% transaction fee. Everybody does. The companies you want to be long are those private companies in crypto that you can read the white papers of, whose protocols have utility, and who's building some element of infrastructure that replaces a traditional business. So as long as you can kind of build those things up, Balaji, for example, had a bunch of tweets this weekend where he was like, you know, I, he has this idea for a mirror table. What is that? That replaces, you know, cap table management, right? Now, why is that important? Well, it's because it touches all of these really important KYC, AML, investing laws across all these countries in all of these places. It's just a very simple example of where the new company that actually builds that capability of these mirror tables will do so at virtually no cost. And so it'll have a 50-person team. And so they're not going to have offices all over the world. Their cost basis will be you know, an order, order or two orders of magnitude well, I mean, cheaper. Let's face it, Visa and MasterCard became a tax. It you took can't them decades with these and companies. decades to have that power over folks. And, 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 and they, but I think a firm does break that. A firm breaks it because yeah. the people who are selling then decide, you know what? We'll give a little bit of a discount here to get more people to buy. Go ahead. They, they were the classic network monopoly, network effect monopoly business, right? Like they yeah. got the small businesses, they got the credit cards and uh, by extension, the consumers on the network. And ultimately they created these, these absolutely locked in networks. Um, but as with all networks, complacency kind of you know, drives innovation and this fueled innovation that we're seeing is now starting to figure out ways to not just crack their way into the network, but to replace them with an entirely different model. Last point on this, this is not one where I think this disruption happens slow. I think it happens swiftly. Swiftly being five to 10 years? No, like in a year. Yeah, Chamath's oh. point is really interesting because there's, you know, there are several billion people globally who do not have credit and who are unbanked. And so if you think about where this is more likely to come from, it's more likely to come from an sure. innovative model in those markets that then ultimately finds its way into the developed world versus you know, trying to break apart Visa and MasterCard and go get these small businesses to switch out of them and so on. Uh, today. So it's, it's a really interesting. Point. Okay. What's up, guys? It is Tuesday, July 4th. It's 11.02 a.m. and happy 4th of July. So the video we just saw at the beginning, that was a VC venture capitalist. I believe he was one of the original investors of Facebook. He's kind of well known. I'm sure you recognize his face. But basically back in 2022, he was outlining, you know, the traditional rails and that whole network where the middleman takes that cut getting displaced by a few select crypto projects or protocols that are purposely and have the utility set up to usher in this new system here. So we're about a year later and we're seeing that. XRP is one of the outperformers for the year. And I think we haven't even seen nothing yet. XLM as well too, haven't seen nothing yet. Those two are the sole ones set up for payments, set up for payments and replacing that infrastructure, one for retail, one for wholesale. So I think the writing's on the wall here. And I wanted to dive into this. So the BRICS countries are planning to introduce a new trading currency, which will be backed by gold. More and more countries recently express desire to join BRICS. So let's go into this article. Article, and this kind of reminded me of one thing. So huge news out of Stellar the other day. First of all, there was a Stellar unlocking human potential. And this is going to be September 26th to 28th. It's their annual conference, which reminds me, I wonder when Ripples is this year. I think it's November usually. But then also Stellar and Danielle Dixon, she had tweeted, let's go to it. You have proud to see Stellar orgs, this lady here, or this guy here, ex-Federal Reserve. Head of GR, Stellar Development Foundation, former Hill, ex-City, ex-Federal Reserve, Yankees, Knicks, Giants, named a subcommittee member to the CFTC advisory group. So Stellar being, you know, behind the scenes with the CFTC seems so. So today, CFTC fam announced new members and leadership of the CFTC Global Markets Advisory Committee and subcommittees. We click on this link here, brings us to um, the new people that joined. And one of them was somebody from Stellar. You also had someone from Uniswap. We go down here, Galaxy Digital, Digital Asset, Crypto.com, Franklin Templin, Fidelity Digital Assets. You have Polygon, Stellar, baby. Stellar right there. So um, yeah, so they joined that advisory committee. 
recently announced 2023 to 2025 proposed work program for the GMAC Global Market Structure Subcommittee here. But there was also more right here, right here. The Stellar Network powers Wisdom Tree's new app, Prime, providing snappy transaction confirmations across many investment choices. Are we entering the new age of finance app? If we click here, you have why it matters if this new product is approved. It would give the crypto rich and blockchain native funds a way to access the strong returns on government debt right now without changing their approach to portfolio management. We go down here still. So what they're watching, okay, it goes into it. But yeah, what's this Wisdom Tree Prime? So how it works, it's powered by the Stellar Blockchain's code base, a long running system built for snappy transaction confirmation. And if we keep going down here, so Maple, I guess, is picking up the lending part of it. I think that's Maple Finance. But if you go to this Wisdom Tree Prime, so be among the first to access Wisdom Tree Prime, the new financial app that lets you save, spend, transfer, and invest digital digital assets like US dollars and gold tokens, crypto, digital funds, and more. Huge. Absolutely huge. Powered by Stellar. Powered by Stellar here. So I found that to be pretty interesting there. And then if we go to what I wanted to go into. Oh, but before I forget, you have Grayscale, Lumens Trust, skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. So let's go to that right here. I believe if we go to performance, then you can see it. See that gray spike? Skyrocketing. Somebody knows something. Somebody knows something. We have a lot of news that's been released kind of under the radar. But let's keep going here because we have BRICS currency you could shake the dollar's dominance. The dollarization's moment might finally be here. This is April 24th. Talking de-dollarization is in the air last month in New Delhi. Uh, Deputy Chairman of Russia State Duma said that Russia is now spearheading the development of a new currency. It is to be used for cross-border trade by the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And weeks later in Beijing, Brazil's president chimed in every night, he said. He asked himself why all countries have to base their trade on the dollar. These developments complicate the narrative that the dollar's reign is stable because it is the one-eyed money in a land of blind individual competitors like euro, yen, and yuan. As one economist put it, Europe is a museum, Japan is a nursing home, and China is a jail. He's not wrong, but a BRICS-issued currency would be different. It'd be like a new union of up-and-coming discon discontents who, on the scale of GDP, now collectively outweigh not only the reigning hegemon, the United States, but the entire G7 weight class put together. Foreign governments wanting to liberate themselves from reliance on the US dollar are anything but new. And foreign capitals about a desire to dethrone the dollar have been making headlines since 1960s. Talking about like, what, 60 years? 63 years right now? But the talk is yet to turn into results. By one measure, the dollar is now used in 84.3% of cross-border trade compared to just 4.5% of the Chinese yuan. And on a litany of practical questions, like how much the other BRICS nations are on board with the proposal, for now, answers remain unclear. But we're going to know in August... Nevertheless, at least based on the economics of BRICS issued currency prospects for success are new. However, early plans for it are, and however many practical questions remain unanswered, such a currency really could dislodge the US dollar as a reserve currency of BRICS members, unlike competitors proposed in the past, like a digital one. This hypothetical currency actually has the potential to usurp or at least shake the dollar's place on the throne. Let's call the hypo hypothetical currency the BRIC. If the BRICs use only the BRIC for international trade, this would remove an impendent that now thwarts their efforts to escape the dollar hegemony. Those efforts now often take the form of bilateral agreements that denominate trade in non-dollar currencies like yuan, now the main currency of trade between China and Russia. The impediment Russia is unwilling to source the rest of its imports from China. So after bilateral transactions between the two countries, Russia tends to want to park the proceeds in dollar-denominated denom assets to buy the rest of its imports from the rest of the world, which still uses the dollar for trade. If China and Russia each only use the brick for trade, however, Russia would not have any need to park the proceeds of bilateral trade in dollars. After all, Russia would be using bricks, not dollars, to buy the rest of its import. Enter at last the dollarization. Is it realistic, realistic to imagine the bricks using only the brick for trade? Yes. For starters, they could fund the entirety of their import bills by themselves. In 2022, they ran a trade surplus. The BRICS would also be posed to achieve a level of self-sufficiency in international trade that it has eluded the world's other currency unions because a BRICS currency union, unlike any before it, would not be among countries united by shared territorial borders. Its members would likely be able to produce a wider range of goods than any existing monetary union. 
an artifact of geographic diversity that is an opening for a degree of self-sufficiency that has painfully eluded currency unions defined by geographic concentration. But the BRICS would not even need to trade only with each other because each member of the BRICS group grouping is an economic heavyweight in its own region. Countries around the world would likely be willing to do business in the BRIC if Thailand felt compelled to use the BRIC to do business with China, Brazil's importers could still purchase shrimp from Thai exporters, keeping Thailand shrimp on Brazil's menus. Good pro- goods produced in one country can also circumvent trade restrictions between two countries by being exported to and then re-exported from a third country. That's often a consequence of new trade restrictions like tariffs. If the United States boycotted bilateral trade with China rather than trade in the BRIC, its children could continue to play with Chinese-made toys that became exports to countries like Vietnam and then exports to the United States. So there's always a way around things. So the brick would also need safe assets to be parked in when not in use for trade. Is it real realistic to imagine the brick finding these? Yes. So they're talking about um, the nominee in the brick would actually like unusually attract to foreign investors. Among the major drawbacks of gold as an asset class for global investors is that in spite of its risk reducing values of diversifier, it does not pay interest. Since the BRICS reportedly plan to back their new currency with gold and other metals with intrinsic value like rare earth metals, interest paying assets denominated in the BRIC would resemble interest paying gold. That's huge. That's an unusual characteristic. It is one that can make the assets denominated in the BRIC attractive to investors who want both the interest bearing property of bonds and the diversifying properties of gold. For BRICS bonds to simply function as an interest-bearing version of gold, they need to be preserved as having a relatively low risk of default. And the debt even of sovereign governments in the BRICS countries have non-trivial default risks, but these risks could be mitigated. So if we go down, the BRIC, to be fair, would raise a litany of thorny practical concern used primarily for international trade rather than domestic circulation circulation with any one country, the BRIC would complicate the job of national central bankers in BRICS countries, creating a supranational central bank like the European Central Bank to manage the BRIC would also take work. These are challenges, but not necessarily insurmountable ones. Then it keeps going down. Let's see. Let's see. So much of the world would still use dollars and the global monetary order would become more multipolar than unipolar. And the dollar's global role in trade has always been a double-edged sword for the United States. Among those who understand that the dollar's global role comes at the expense of jobs and export competitiveness at home, at least based on comments from 2014, we keep going down. If the BRICS replaces the dollar as the reserve currency of the BRICS, the reactions will be varied and bizarre. Applause seems poised to come loudly from officials in BRICS countries with anti-imperialist dispositions from certain Republicans in the U.S. and from U.S. President Joe Biden. Boos seem poised to animate from both former U.S. President Donald Trump and the U.S. national security community that he so often feuds with. Either way, the dollar's reign isn't likely to end overnight, but a brick would begin the slow erosion of its dominance. And we're heading into next month. Next month, we have the BRICS conference, the annual conference. It's in uh, South Africa. They're hosting it this year. BRICS pay. BRICS pay, decentralized multi-currency digital international payment system, open to innovations for all countries, for all forms of money, for all of humanity, about BRICS pay project. It's a joint venture between the five BRICS countries that was launched in 2018 by the BRICS Business Council among the top priorities in the annual report. The team behind the venture consists of individuals from all five countries, includes experts in payments, banking, technology, and other related fields. They're responsible for developing the platform, creating new features, and providing customer support. Additionally, the team is responsible for managing relationships with partners, governments, and other stakeholders. And it's the digital payments platform is being jointly developed by the member countries of BRICS. It aims to enable digital payments between the different countries in BRICS Plus format, allowing businesses and consumers to securely and seamlessly make and receive payments in their local currency. That platform is designed to reduce the cost and complexity of international payments while also providing a secure and reliable way to pay for goods and services. So it sets benefits from a combination of traditional payment systems and new technology, technologies such as CBDCs, DeFi, and tokenized assets. BRICS Pay is an expansion of payment options for companies and citizens of participating countries, as well as for the entire world and all existing or emergent payment solutions. It talks about interoperability, decentralization, security, transparency, sustainability, justice, efficiency, responsibility, and exclusiveness. 
Then it goes into the project structure. So it lays it all out here. Settlements and clearing, BRICS, CBDC. Settlements between BRICS pay countries are expected to be made in wholesale digital currency. The principles of interaction with national currency, calculation of rates, emissions, and clearing are under development. So there we go. There And it's independent distributed system with asymmetric encryption, supports SWIFT messaging standard, and will also work with SIPs and SPFS messaging. So across the board, BRICS pay, heavy eyes on it, decentralized multi-currency digital international payment system. And then there's this talk of this new BRICS currency backed by rare earth metals that's set to be unveiled all the details in about a month from now. In about a month from now, all the while the dollar looks like it's going to tank and all the while crypto looks like it's going to boom, right? So that's what's going on right now. And on top of it, we got once in a blue moon. So when is the next blue moon? It takes place on August 31st, as this moon is also a super moon as well too. As well too. So it'll be a super blue moon. Super blue moon. Something's going to happen August 31st, September 1st. You can feel it. You can feel it. Put it on the radar. It's the 13th moon of the year. We usually only have 12 full moons a year. This year we have 13. So for those that know, you know. So I'm going to leave it off at that, guys. Actually, you know what? I'm going to play this because patterns will repeat. Simulations will continue. And I'm going to leave it at that. And then I'll see you guys in the next video. If you want to get rich in crypto in 2023, there's literally only one coin that can make this possible. We are setting up in the most fucking bullish, perfect chart setup I have ever seen in crypto. We're talking about none other than Ripple XRP. I am currently long. I just got in a few weeks ago at about it's the exact same pattern that I traded back in 2020, where XRP went from 20 cents upwards of two dollars per coin. Now, what we had on XRP back in 2020, followed by what I call a revival breakout, where we have a descending kind of breakout from as soon as this broke out above 32 cents, it had a big run to the upside of about 180%. And then the SEC announced this case right about here. Now, finally, after a long couple of year wait, the SEC announced that we have the exact same pattern. A lead is still about 55. If this broke out on news of them winning the SEC case, I do believe this is going on a monumental run to break out to all time highs, go over the $2 level, at least go anywhere from $3 to $5 per token. 